Here's why bodily rights arguments for abortion logically necessitate extremism. Bodily rights arguments for abortion are always extremist arguments, at least in the way people present them. No bodily rights argument that I have ever seen, or even heard of any pro-choice advocate making, leaves room for exceptions. But the majority of these people believe there should be times when abortion should be illegal. Almost all pro-choice people make bodily rights arguments, but most of these people, well-meaning or not, are flagrantly inconsistent. Usually there's a stage in pregnancy they're uncomfortable with, and often there are reasons for abortion that they don't agree with. I frequently hear, you shouldn't be able to have an abortion for sex selection, or there should be a limit on how many abortions someone can get, or they shouldn't be able to use it for birth control. This is clearly not a well-thought-out position. It's the position of someone that has some of their moral intuitions intact, like about how awful late-term abortion is, but they haven't thought beyond the talking point they're using to justify other abortions. There is no way to consistently argue that first trimester abortions should be legal because it's a woman's right to decide what to do with her body, and second trimester abortions should not be legal. If the thing that justifies abortion in the first trimester is women's bodily autonomy, then abortion continues to be justified in the second and third trimester because the fetus still resides inside her body. The same principle applies to distasteful reasons for abortions. You may not like sex-selective abortions, but you can't oppose them while simultaneously supporting early abortions with bodily rights arguments. The violinist argument falls into the same problem. If you're justifying abortion by arguing that women have the right to abort just like you have the right to unplug from a violinist, then you can't make exceptions. If I want to unplug from the violinist because the violinist is African American and I'm a racist, I still have the right to unplug. If I want to unplug eight months into the procedure, I still have the right to unplug. Similarly, if someone wants an abortion at eight months or because of sex selection or even racism, you can't deny it to her if you're justifying the other abortions through bodily autonomy. The only reasonable way to justify a pro-choice position with exceptions is to argue that the unborn is not a human person early in pregnancy, but becomes a person later in pregnancy. I'm not saying that's a good position, but it can at least be logically consistent. If you become a person when you can feel pain, then it makes sense to oppose abortion after a fetus can feel pain. The problem comes if you are justifying abortion by making a bodily rights argument. As soon as you do that, you have thrown open the door to accepting all abortions, and the only question is whether you're consistent enough to recognize it. How to turn the tables. In an earlier blog post, I described how powerful it is to turn the tables on pro-choice rhetoric. This is another great example of a time to do that. I don't have a good example of a specific story where I did this, so what follows is merely an estimation of the type of conversation I've had many times. This is just for the sake of illustrating the idea these are not direct quotations from a specific conversation. In the blog post, I did this in dialogue form, but that would just be weird uh, for just me to read both sides of the dialogue, so Josh is going to read uh, the other person in the conversation. Why are you pro-choice? My body, my choice. It's nobody else's business what I do with my own body. I'd like to understand your view better. Do you think there are any circumstances when a woman shouldn't be allowed to get an abortion? What do you mean? Well, I'll give you a common example. Most people are pretty uncomfortable with abortions at like eight months. What do you think? Oh, I I'm definitely not for that. I I I'm only for abortion in the first 20 weeks. Really? I'm confused. At 22 weeks, isn't it her body, her choice? How is it anyone else's business what she does with her body? Well, I, I get what you mean, but, but after 20 weeks, it's too late. The, the baby is too developed. I want to understand your view, but I'm struggling. Based on what you just said, it seems like you aren't really justifying abortion with bodily rights. It seems like you're justifying abortion by claiming that a fetus doesn't count as a human person until 20 weeks. The bodily rights claim isn't sufficient by itself to justify abortion, because as soon as you think the fetus is human, you don't think abortion is justified. Yeah, I, I think both at the same time. In the first 20 weeks, it isn't a person, and women should have the right over their bodies. I actually think you don't need the bodily rights argument. If the fetus isn't a person, I think abortion is obviously justified, don't you? Yeah, I, I, I guess so. Bodily autonomy just matters a lot to me. That makes sense. I think bodily autonomy is really important, too. It seems like our main disagreement isn't about bodily autonomy, though. It seems like we need to determine if the fetus is a human person. Notice how vacuous the pro-choice rhetoric is if they have exceptions. It's nobody else's business what I do with my own body, but only in the circumstances I'm comfortable with. You should also notice that the extremely common arguments about back-alley abortions have the exact same problem. If you're going to justify a first-trimester abortion by arguing that it's better to keep abortions legal so women don't seek them illegally, then how can you justify making any abortion illegal? If you make an abortion illegal, a woman might seek it anyway and do it unsafely. When people make extremist arguments, like bodily rights arguments and back-alley abortion arguments, I'm not recommending that you treat them rudely or call them names. I'm not saying to scream at them that they're extremists. Please don't do that. I'm suggesting that you help them to understand the logic of their argument. Help them to see that they only have two options. Either one, embrace the extremist position, 
or two, reject the extremist argument. But what if we make people even more pro-choice? There is a clear risk to this strategy. Sometimes they'll just embrace their extremism, and then they'll walk away even more pro-choice than before. My colleague Jacob Nels shared this story with me of a conversation he had at Grand Valley State University the day before we went to Aquinas College. He said, I engaged a young female professor in a dialogue by asking her, Excuse me, ma'am, would you take a moment to sign our poll? Should 20-week abortions be legal? She signed no. Thanks for signing our poll. Would you mind telling me why you answered no? Once it goes that far along, abortions shouldn't happen. Okay. Would you help me understand where the line is for you and why? I showed her field development pictures in the ERI brochure. Could you point out when in human development abortion is not okay? I'm not really sure. After a few more minutes of conversation, she said, Women should have the right to do what they want with their body. It sounds like you are saying that you believe women should have a right to complete bodily autonomy, and you do still believe the unborn is a human person. So is it your belief that a woman's right to bodily autonomy supersedes the life of the fetus? Yes. Could you clarify that for me? It seems like your statement that women should have complete bodily autonomy is in direct conflict with your answer to our poll that 20-week abortions should not be legal. Have you ever seen a picture of a 20-week abortion? No, I haven't. I have one here. May I show it to you? She agreed and looked at the picture. In the blog post version of this, we have a link where you can see the picture that Jacob showed her. Uh, so if you want to see that, then you can go to the blog post. Warning, it is extremely graphic. The professor responded, Oh, this is really bad. Yeah, it is. But in order to be consistent with your belief in bodily autonomy, then this procedure would have to be okay. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. I, I have to get going to class, but can I change my vote? Jacob's heart sank as he watched her switch her vote from no to yes, 20-week abortions should be legal. She left and didn't come back. So Jacob reasonably asks, isn't this a dangerous approach? Aren't we going to help some people become more pro-choice? I've run into the same problem when I've responded to pro-choice arguments for personhood by pointing out that the other person's understanding of personhood would either include animals like squirrels or exclude newborn humans. Sometimes they react by abandoning their pro-choice argument, but other times they double down and say, fine, then it's okay to kill newborns, or fine, then squirrels are people too. When people react that way, in one sense it is like they become more pro-choice, but they won't be more comfortably pro-choice. There is a type of pro-choice view that many pro-choice people hold. It's a view that feels really moderate, reasonable, and compassionate. They know they're uncomfortable with late-term abortion, but they also know they want first trimester abortions legal, so they just start believing both things. They get comfortable with these beliefs. My goal is to graciously drive the comfortable pro-choice position into extinction. It is frustrating to see people bite the bullet on awful extremist views. I have watched pro-choice students go as far as to say that parents should have the legal right to kill their 10-year-olds, because that was what it took for them to remain pro-choice about abortion. But I actually think that leaves them better off. I would rather they walk away knowing they had to agree to something truly horrific in order to remain pro-choice. One of the best ways to help someone to change her mind about abortion is to make her experience cognitive dissonance. If a person's only options are one, pro-life, or two, horrifically pro-choice, most people have enough decency to eventually choose the former. I'm cautiously optimistic that many of the college students I've seen agree to awful conclusions will grow up eventually and recognize that squirrels aren't people, rape is actually wrong, not just distasteful, and that a newborn child has the right to live. Some won't. But I'm honestly more interested in pulling the moderates to our side than I am worried about helping the most hardcore pro-choice people become even more extreme. If thousands of comfortable pro-choice people have to choose between the extremism that their arguments demand and the voices of their consciences, then many of them will become pro-life.